Open your Bibles, if you will, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We began the study uh, of the fifth chapter of of 2 Corinthians last week, and we're going to pick up uh, today where we left off. Paul had reminded us that uh, life is full of of contrast for the believer. He lives in a world lost in sin, but he also lives in that world of hope uh, where all things are made new. And he he says, this old tent is going to pass away. I've got a a permanent home in heaven. This, uh, this uh, groaning will be uh, replaced with glory. I can look forward to tomorrow. And uh, today we're going to continue a little bit of review in, uh, in the uh, uh, beginning and the first point on, on the persuading men. And then uh, we're going to look at the rest of chapter uh, 5, beginning with verse uh, 10 today. And we'll go down through verse 20, uh, verse 21, as we look at the subject of uh, the marvelous uh, redemption that the Lord has purchased and uh, how he has placed that in our hands, that we are indeed ambassadors for Christ. And we're going to begin with uh, verse 10. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to open his word to our hearts and to our minds. Father, we thank you for the privilege again of sharing your word. Thank you for uh, your eternal word and for the way that you've inspired it, that you've put it down for us and that you apply it by your Holy Spirit. We ask you to guide us today as we look at this uh, letter from Paul to the church at Corinth, and as he uh, speaks to our hearts, we ask you that that, that we might be obedient to your word and to your way, and that we might grow in you, for we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, as Paul continues to to write to uh, the Corinthian believers, remember first of all that that he is speaking, uh, he is defending the faith, he is uh, there are those who have maligned him, said, Paul, you're not real, and uh, you need to get real, and you're not an, a, real, a, a real apostle. And so most of Second Corinthians deals with his defense of the ministry. And in doing so, he begins to tell us what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. So beginning with verse 10, uh, for, uh, uh, in fact, I'm going to back up to verse 9 and get us, get us some background. Paul writing to us today said, Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. I don't know whether you noticed it or not, but um, most of the hymns that we sang today, one, at least one stanza said, We make it our, our aim to live for him who died for us. We stand beneath the cross. We stand in, re- in readiness to serve. In verse 10 he said, for, I, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to that which he has done, whether it is good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known of God, and I trust also of you. For we do not uh, commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast in our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. Verse 13, for we, uh, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ cons- compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. We're going to look at the first few verses first of all, and then we'll come back and finish the passage. But Paul begins uh, again by, by, by uh, giving a therefore, because all of the contrasts in life, because uh, we, we groan today and we glory tomorrow, because this old life is passing away, but we have an eternal life coming, uh, because like a tent, this one is going to be dismantled and we have an eternal home in heaven because of all that God in Christ has done. Therefore, in verse 9, we make it our aim to be present, to, whether, whether we're here or there, whether we're alive or, or gone, we, we will be pleasing unto him. It's a great verse uh, to know in, by memory. And then he goes on to say, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We, uh, we have an appointment with with. Uh, with, with our Lord Jesus at the time of the, uh, right after the uh, uh, 
the rapture of the church. We're going to be stand before him and give an account of our life. And he said, uh, whether we are present or absent, uh, we will be, be there. Uh, pardon me, I read, read the wrong verse. Uh, we, to, uh, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether they be good or bad. He says we have, a, we have a time coming that we will stand before the Lord and it is a time when we will uh, give an account of our life and we will be examined uh, for the things in life that we have done. This, this, uh, this judgment seat has nothing to do with our salvation. That was settled the moment we said, yes, Lord, I believe. It was settled on the cross of Calvary once and for all. And so those who trust in him, uh, that, the salvation is eternal. But we will stand and give an account of our Christian life, of our service to him. And he said, there will be things that are good, gold, silver, he, uh, precious jewels, he, tells, he says in 1 Corinthians, or there will be things that will be burned up. Uh, even before the time of the judgment coming, uh, that judgment seat, uh, wood, hay, stubble, some things that we do invest in eternity, some things are just like that and gone. And uh, Paul said we, we give an account of the things, whether they be good, like good fruit, or whether they be bad, we're going to be given. We, and from those, uh, based on, on the good and the bad, we will receive rewards for those things. It, it's, a, it's an athletic picture, actually. Um, the, the, the word is used for judgment in the, uh, in the Gospels, but in the book of Acts and in the, books, in the letter of Paul, it's always used to, uh, to, to, uh, as the reward for, for a good athlete. He said, therefore, I run the race. I, I buffet my body. I'm always prepared. I, I play by the rules. And just like those who are preparing for the, the Olympics now, they want to play by the rules. They want to run the race correctly. They want to do it well. They know that there are going to be some judges there and they are going to be uh, determined uh, th their reward is going to be determined by how they run the race and so it is in our lives uh, and will be on that day of judgment therefore knowing that is and knowing that's going to happen we have a great respect we have a terror of the Lord we persuade men he says uh, to uh, uh, first of all, to, to, uh, we persuade men to believe in us. It's a defense of the ministry. And uh, he'd, he'd already uh, brought this up several times before in, in this letter, but that's what, that was the purpose for the letter. He said, we, we want to convince those, and to, to persuade means I, I marshal an argument. I, 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 use verbal, uh, I use a verbal argument to bring a person from this uh, this view over here to that which is correct over here. I tr I try to I try to change their mind. It's like preaching, and uh, uh, he says I want to I want to persuade their mind uh, to uh, to know that this is a real ministry of God, and uh, uh, therefore we 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 stand in terror. We stand in honor of that, uh, ready to persuade men first of all to believe in our ministry and to to support it and to and he, then he says to the Corinthians in verse 11 you already we've persuaded you verse 12 and uh, we we don't need to therefore uh, uh I commend ourselves again to you. We've persuaded you. You, you, you know who we are. But then he goes on to say in verse 13, for we are, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are of sound mind, it is for you. That's a, um, a passage that pastors slip over a lot of times because they're not sure what it's saying. But he says, we're a fool for Christ as far as the world goes. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, he says, uh, uh, "For we are fools for Christ's sake, but, we, but you are wise. We are weak, but you are strong. We are disinterested. We are disting you are distinguished, but we are in dishonor. We are fools, he says. We'll make a fool of ourselves for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, for for we, but if but if we're a sound mind, those who had believed, as they would see him in a sound mind, uh, they said, "Yeah, he's 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 quite okay, and uh, he's of sound mind. He's not he's not a fool for Christ." He'll pick this theme up again later on in the letter in chapter eleven, and then in verse fourteen, he tells us uh, to be reckoned. Yeah, make sure I got the right passage. 
in, in verse 14, he says, For the love of Christ can tell us. We are compelled uh, by love. For, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And uh, in this passage, he, he um, is um, probably one of the, uh, this verse in verse 17, probably the best known verses in this particular passage. And he said, first of all, for the love of Christ compels us. Uh, the, uh, uh, the word compel there is we, we are, let me, get, let me back up a little bit. Um, therefore, he says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Notice, uh, uh, wrong, wrong, wrong verse, there we go. For the love of Christ compels us, because we, thus, we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. It's a compelling love that Paul is talking about. Uh, I've heard sermons on this particular passage, how, how our love for Christ ought to compel us, ought to motivate us, ought to, uh, ought to, to cause us to go about uh, doing the will and the way of God. And that is a truth, but this is not, that's not the truth of this verse. The, 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 the love there, the word is agape, the God kind of love, um, is, is of Christ. Uh, love is the noun. The first, uh, the, the word love there is the noun. It's the subject of the verse. The of Christ also is a noun. It's what they call the nominative. It's called the, uh, the genitive, which means it tells the source of that love. And so he says, it's love that comes from Christ that controls us. He's talk, Paul is talking not about his love for the Lord or our love for the Lord, although we have that, but he's talking about God's love, Christ's love for the lost and for all mankind. And he said that that kind of love compels us. Um, the word compel uh, means to, uh, to, to constrain, to put in a straight. It's used uh, about four times in, in, the, in, the, in the scripture. It's used in Luke chapter 4 and verse 38. It's translated taken as referring to uh, Peter's mother-in-law. She is taken ill and she's in, uh, in the bed. And the Lord goes in and heals her. In Acts chapter 15, Chapter 18 in verse 5, which forms the background of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Paul uh, says, I was pressed in the spirit. The word is the same, that word pressed there. I was confined in the spirit um, when he first visited the city of, of Corinth. Paul was compelled by the Spirit then and testified that Jesus was the Christ. Over in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 23, when Paul wrote the church at Philippi, uh, he said, I am hard-pressed. Uh, KJV, the King James Version translates it, I'm in a strait between two places. Uh, on the one hand, he said, I, I want to be depart and be with the Lord, but I know that it's better for me to be here uh, for, your, for your sake. And then in Luke chapter 12, verse 50, Jesus speaking of the cross, he said, and, I, and how distressed I am. All of those words, all of those contexts say it, it's not... The, the the word compel is is not to be driven, but it's to be confined. It's, uh, here's the boundaries that I can live in. I am confined. I am pressed in. That therein, uh, the, the, that that kind of love keeps me in. Uh, that's where I'm going to walk. It's it's the the, the straight and narrow. It, it is being confined to one thing. Jesus said, uh, "I'm going to the cross," and that's what he, exactly what he would do. And uh, the woman, uh, Peter's mother-in-law, was confined to the bed. She couldn't get up. She she had a bad fever, and the Lord healed her. And uh, so he, it is here, he says, the love constrains me. He, he puts the boundaries in our life and uh, constrains me. And then he gives a right judgment in that same verse, uh, having judged thus, that if one died for all, then the whole died. Don't miss this truth here. First of all, he says, uh, having judged, the word is krino, um, Eris, Eris means it's, there, there's a point in time when he ran things through his mind, an action uh, of, of considering the evidence and looking at uh, the results and reaching then a verdict of the mind to say, I've come to the conclusion, I now, I now believe that if one died for all, then all must be dead. 
in him. Didn't Paul say you are dead in your trespasses and sin? The wages of sin is death. And uh, so one died for all. And uh, uh, it's, it's a passage that says, I want you to stop and think a moment. Have you gone through the, the evidence of Christ and come to the conclusion then, he died for all, therefore those whom he died for if they're going to live, are going to have to live in him. And that's, uh, it, it, it requires a little bit of the, of the gray matter uh, to, to work that through. And he said, one died for all, then all are dead. And he who died for all, that those who live, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live unto themselves. So um, he died for all. And uh, they, they judged. One died for all. The one is the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for all. One died for all. He gave his life on Calvary. Uh, and we've been talking about that. The pastor's been leading us through the passages uh, of the New Testament on the death, on the in the Gospels of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for them. That's a preposition. On behalf of. The, Isaiah wrote, Surely he hath borne our sorrows, carried our griefs, he took our place. He died in place of us. It's a substitutionary death. Paul wrote to the Galatian churches, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And then catch this. He died for all. And you say, well, why? what's the... What's the deal here? What's the emphasis? Why would you uh, em emphasize that, that he died for all? Have you ever heard of Calvinism? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, th they would say, well, he didn't die for all. He died for the elect. I looked up my favorite Calvinist uh, in, in, a, in a commentary the last couple of weeks, and, and he said uh, he died for all of those who loved him when they, di when they died. Uh, it's the same difference. Calvinism, you know, has, a, has the tulip, if you're familiar with that. And there are five things that, that, that are the heart of Calvinism. Uh, total depravity, we wouldn't agree with what they would say about that either. Uh, uh, un, undeniable election, we wouldn't agree with what they say there either. Uh, the, uh, limited atonement, he died for the elect, we wouldn't agree with that there. Uh, I don't agree with the I and the P either. Uh, Christ died for all. What a glory. Uh, it, that means that whosoever will may come. It means that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so uh, he died for all. The scripture is, uh, uh, gives that message very clear. Paul wrote to Timothy in First uh, Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. He said, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The writer of Hebrews said, But, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering and death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. And then in, in 1 John 2, John wrote, And he himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the propitiation, the payment, the payment in full of our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. The Lord Jesus Christ hung on that cross. He died in my place and in your place. And he did it for everyone for all time. And uh, it's not a limited atonement. It is a general atonement for all kind, all mankind. And then, then, then all died. If, if one died for all, then all died. All were dead in trespasses and sin. We'll talk about that in a moment. And in uh, uh, a little more uh, effort. Whoops, I forgot to put that up for you. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, we, in verse 15 then, and I think this is the key to, to verse 17 as well, uh, Christ, uh, let me read verse 15, and he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. 
one died for all, and those who come to him by faith, he die, they, they should no longer live unto themselves, but, uh, but uh, for, the, for him who died for them and rose again. Paul lived that out. Christ loved all. Uh, for, Christ's love was for all uh, and compelled him to die for all, that all might henceforth live through, through him and for him. Uh, and we live through him and for him. Because he died for all, those who now live would live for him. Paul said, Likewise reckon ye yourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He, got, he died for me, I live for him. Uh, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet I don't live. But Christ lives in me, and the life I live today, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave his life for me. Uh, Paul wrote to the church at Rome, and he said, I, I beseech you, and it's the same word he's going to use later on uh, in this passage, I beseech you that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy unto God, that you might prove what is that good and perfect will of God. And so he, he came to, he said, I don't live but Christ lives in me. And then verse 16, Therefore, from now on, we regard no man according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him no longer. And there's a new understanding of man. When Paul headed out to, to uh, go to Damascus in uh, the ninth chapter of, of uh, Acts, you remember he had gone to the Sanhedrin, to the, to the authorities, the Jewish authorities, and uh, he had received authority and power and papers uh, to go to Damascus and remove this thing called Christianity. Take away, uh, arrest, kill, re re remove those who were followers of the way, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. He headed down that road. You know, you can, uh, you can Google uh, this, the... Um, the road today, you can you can look up uh, Straight Street, uh, and uh, on uh, you you don't recognize anything, but you can do that. But it's still there. And Paul headed down that road. To the, I think it's the second oldest city in the world, and he he headed down that road with a hatred in his heart. He would do anything to stamp out Christianity. He would do anything to malign the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. His heart was burning with hatred, and so he walked down, and suddenly there was a great light above, and he heard the voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he asked the question, who are you, Lord, or who are you, Master? And Jesus told him who he was, and he told him he wanted him to come to him. He wanted to send him as a, an apostle to the Gentiles. Paul... Paul's life was turned around that day, and uh, he went on to Damascus this time with, uh, for the Savior and for his master, and eventually would come to full realization of that. And so he said, I have a new understanding. There was a time when I looked at the Lord in the flesh. I thought he was just another teacher who was trying to lead us astray, Judaism astray, who was trying to capture Judaism and, and take it to his own way. I, I saw him simply in the flesh. We, um, if you ever turn on the TV and watch the news, I don't recommend it. Uh, they, they look at things simply in the flesh. They don't understand. No one understands, no one outside of Christ understands the motivation, the drive, the, uh, the, con the, the constraining power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they look at us in the flesh. I, I remember a news report reporter one day telling about a, a religious leader, a, a, a Baptist pastor, I think it was, and, and she kind of, uh, how do you say that, with an air of, of uh, I know and you don't, he said, he takes the scripture literally. And I said, you're right. You take everything, you, you, you believe the newspaper, literally. And uh, uh, and, I, and I'll guarantee you, the scripture 
is a lot more accurate than the newspaper. In fact, it's completely accurate. And so, yes, we do take it literally, uh, not after the flesh. And so Paul said, we have a new life, a new understanding of men. And I knew you in the flesh, and now you know me, not only in the flesh, but now you know me in the spirit. And so we go on to verse 17. That's the one that I was go- that started to say. This is the probably the most popular verse in this passage. And I trust that you have, have uh, memorized it and you've, repro- you've uh, re- uh, shared it with others. He said, Paul says, Therefore, because uh, Christ died for all, and therefore all are dead, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, and that's a command, by the way. Behold, all things have become new. It's a new creation. It's the second, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, then he is a new creation. Notice that, that Paul um, changes the person in this verse. Up to this point, it is we. Uh, in verse 16, he says, we know him. Um, uh, it is talking about, it is the second person. And then all of a sudden he changes in verse 17 and he said, now if anyone. He's talked about, he's talked about those who've come to Christ and therefore they're a new creation. And he said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, those who come by faith to Jesus Christ, they are a new creation. He is a new creation. And uh, notice the he is is, is parenthesized there, uh, indicating that it's not in the Greek. Uh, he, if anyone is, is, is in Christ, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Everything b- b- passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Uh, if anyone, that includes uh, general atonement again, anyone who would place their faith in Jesus Christ, whosoever will, uh, it is those who are in Christ that Paul is saying, you're a brand new creation. We gotta, Jesus said to Nicodemus, remember, in the third chapter of John, you got to be born again. You got to be born from above. And anyone who is born from above, Paul would say, as saying, anyone then who's come to Christ is a new creation. Old things have passed away. It is the in Christ that's the emphasis. Once once person pla- once a person places their faith in Christ, that he he by the Holy Spirit, takes up dwelling in them. He makes them a new creation in Christ. The, the word creation there is, uh, the word new there is kainos, uh, meaning a new substance, a new kind, something that wasn't before. Uh, it's the same word that would be used if in the Greek in the, in the uh, Old Testament for the old creation. And... Uh, uh, he makes them a new creation, and then he goes on to say, and he, just, to, to, just to emphasize, he says, Behold, all things are become new. All things have become new, and uh, those who trust in Christ have that, are that new creation. They've been born from above. Uh, Paul wrote to the church at, at uh, Galatians, he said, for, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth uh, availeth, uh, anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. We're a new creation in Christ. He said, old things have passed away. Old is the word from which we get our word archaic. I don't like that uh, translation. Uh, because um, people call me old. And uh, I, I worry when I'm driving down I-10 and, and see there's a silver alert. Uh, uh, I don't think that's me. You know, and, uh, and he says, they're archaic. I had to get back to the t- subject at hand here. He said there are, uh, the, you know, the old is, is archaic. Uh, the word passing away is, is that word can, mean, uh, can be a metaphor for death. Uh, it can mean they've passed by. It can mean they've come this way. And uh, uh, I think the third one there is the best uh, translation. They, they, the, the, the new has arrived. It wasn't here before, and now it is. They, the... Uh, 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 it, it, it has arrived. And, and by the way, it's, it's in the aorist tense, which would mean 
It wasn't here, but now it is. There was a point in time when it changed and uh, uh, passed away. That which went by, passed by. And uh, the old life was, is gone, and the new life uh, is in its place. And uh, if you look at uh, Paul and his life, on the road to Damascus, he met the Savior, and he was never the same. A new life had come. He could speak from personal experience. Uh, a life radically changed. I've read the story of, of Sam Houston. If you don't know Sam Houston, you are in trouble in this uh, place. But uh, uh, that, that Sam Houston was, was a real tough, scruffy guy. Used the language of the world. And... Uh, then he came to Christ, and I don't know how true the story is. I don't. I didn't know. I don't know him that well. But he said. Then he came to Christ, and people said, "I want to see if this is real." And sure enough, Sam Houston fell off of his horse, bucked him off of his horse, and landed on the ground, and and got up, dusted himself off, and got back on the horse and didn't say a word. No blue streak. His life was changed, and so it was with Paul. His life was changed, radically changed. In fact, it changed so much that when, when the Lord said to, to uh, Ananias, I'm sending you a guest, he, he answered the Lord, don't you have someone else? You know? Uh, I know that man. But God had radically changed. He was born again. He was made new, a new creation. For the believers in the New Testament, when you read the, story, the account of Paul in the book of Acts, he went into a village and a town, and there he went into the synagogue, and he said to them that Christ is indeed the Messiah. And they came to believe that Christ was the Messiah, and their lives were changed. He, he said of the church at Corinth in, in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, I came and preached the word, and you believe that Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day, all according to the scripture, and you believed that and you have, your life has been changed. You could go back, I trust, to that moment in your life when you said, Lord, I believe. And he changed your life. And for, for, from that time forward, for those who place their faith in Christ, all things have passed away. Behold, behold, all things have become new. But you say... I know somebody that's not living a new life. It didn't work on them, did it? Oh, yes, it did. But verse 16 says, Therefore now, if we, pardon me, verse 15, verse 15, and he died for all, that all those who live should live for him. There are those who will live underneath the, uh, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God, who surrender their life to him, who make that commitment, I'll live for him who died for me. Those are the ones whose new life comes out. The, the, the others are saved the moment they believe. And, but there's a reckoning day that will come, but they've not lost their salvation. Uh, Paul said uh, uh, that... We have a new life in Jesus Christ, and we seek to live for him. Not only do we have a new life, we have a new ministry, the ministry of reconciliation in verses 18 and 19. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Let's look, look, look at it a little closer. So notice again, he starts with a verse with therefore. Therefore now, it's if anyone is in Christ, anyone would be any belie anyone who tra tra trusted Christ. It was a general atonement. Anyone who would believe in him uh, can have eternal, will have eternal life. And so if anyone is in Christ, uh, he is a new creation. And then verse 18, now all things are of God. It begins with uh, God is the author here. He is the one who brought it all about. He talks about a new creation. And just uh, if, if you remember, there's only been one other creation. 
uh, in the beginning was the was was the work in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth he did it through the through through the Lord Jesus Christ but God is the author of that creation and so it is with the new creation God is the author in the Lord Jesus Christ in the garden uh, God, the, the Lord said to Adam uh, you can eat of any tree that you want but of one tree you cannot eat of that tree for the moment that you eat that uh, of that tree uh, you dying you will die and you're going to lose life and sure enough uh, Eve gave Adam the the uh, the fruit and he ate and dying he will die and he died he became man became dead and spiritually dead in that moment and uh, 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 therefore God said to to uh, the, to the snake, to, to Satan, there, there's coming a day that I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Uh, and he shall bruise your head. He shall, let me do, let me do that better. He shall crush your head and you will bruise his heel. And he hung on an old rugged cross and he bruised, Satan bruised his heel. But that moment the Lord crushed his head. Victory was won. Reconciliation had been had been purchased, um, and uh, but uh, and so Paul writes. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth. Let me just get that. Start that over. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His His um, Son. born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law that, they, that we might receive the adoption of sons. He fulfilled it in Jesus Christ. God reconciled to man himself. That word re reconciled, katalazo, uh, is a, again in the aorist tense, means there was a point in time God reconciled man uh, there on the cross of Calvary. And, and it means to take a hostile party and to bring them into harmony. There's hostility and there's division, and yet God on the cross and of the Lord Jesus Christ made a new creation through through bringing God and man, sinful man and, and holy God together, reconciling our sins and uh, uh, through through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul wrote, "For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, how much more, having reconciled, we shall be saved by His life." He has, he's reconciled us unto God and made us his ambassadors for Christ. And notice verse uh, 19, that, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, bringing them together. And there's a passage that is often skipped over, not imputing their sin, I've lost my place again, uh, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. What does imputing mean? Uh, Brother Greg used it in a prayer this morning. I, I, I started to say amen. Uh, uh, he's, he's not imputing their sin. The there is those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Imputing means to, to reckon. It means to add to the account. And because Jesus Christ died on the cross, our propitiation, our, our payment for the payment for our sin and all the sins of the world, uh, therefore, he says, since Christ has taken our sin, he doesn't impute them to us. He doesn't put them on our record. They, are placed, they were placed on him on that moment on the cross. He took one man, took all sin, for all time, for all men, and God placed it all on him. And he cried out in that hour, It is paid in full. It is finished. He's imputed our sin unto him, not unto me any longer. He's taken our sin completely away, not imputing our trespasses, their trespasses to them, and has committed then those that he has redeemed then, those he died for, then those who believe in him, what has he done? He has placed that in our hand and given to us the ministry of reconciliation. We're, we're, 
having come to Christ, we are to go then in Christ and tell the world. And we're going to come, to come to that in just a moment. Uh, we have a, a ministry, not imputing our trespasses to get to us. And he says that in verse 20. Now then, since he has placed this ministry in our hands, um, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you in Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Paul didn't say, now we ought to be ambassadors for Christ. We ought to be servants of Christ. We ought to be witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. But having received the ministry of reconciliation, and I think the, the, the we here, uh, everything from on verse 14 on down, uh, has to include the church of today as well. Not only those believers of the early age, not only Paul and the apostle and, and his group, but we who are in Christ today are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is a person who goes in authority, not his own authority, but the authority of a higher power. And uh, Paul says, we, we are then that ambassador, that representative of a government or representative of a company, in this case, the representative of God. And we, we've been, we are ambassadors for Christ, on behalf of Christ. We go in his name. We go in his power. We go under his mission. We go uh, with his message. Everything is about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us, just as uh, we were not speaking our own, for we're not, but God is pleading through us in verse 19. Uh, pleading is a, is a, a powerful uh, emotional word, uh, pleading, begging, uh, sometimes translated, uh, imploring, exhorting, all of the things that we would do in sharing the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, as though God were, were pleading through us, we implore, and uh, notice the you is uh, in italics there, we implore on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You know, it's, he's not saying it would be real nice if you would share now and then about Jesus. And if you would talk to those who do not know him and say, you know, you ought to, you ought to put your faith in him. But he says, I'm, in, 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 in Christ's stead, I plead with you. I exhort you. I implore you. This is the opportunity you have. Be reconciled unto God. That was the passion that drew Paul. Paul said, I've been constrained by that love, that love that caused Christ to die, that love that placed his ministry in my, in my hands, and I'll go and I'll stand before the world and I'll say to them, be ye reconciled unto God. We live in a world lost and dying in sin. Good lives are wonderful and they have an effect, but nothing changes life like the word of reconciliation. The word is logos there. He's given us the word of reconciliation. And we proclaim that word and there, and we, we proclaim it because of that next passage. For he, God, made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, the spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. How do I offer you new life? Because Jesus Christ became our sin that we might become his righteousness. That we can stand before God as if we'd never sinned at all. He bore our sin on the cross of Calvary and he lives today. One of my favorite hymns is uh, It Is Well With My Soul. Has uh, you know, and I, I came from a, ba a Baptist background. If you don't, didn't know that, I'll, I'll tell. You. I, I came from a ba I went, I'm Baptist to the bone. I just can't help it. Uh, but but we have a we have a tradition in Baptist churches. We sing the first, second, and fourth stanza. We, we we'll all stand now and we'll sing the first, second, and fourth stanza. But the third stanza, Horatio P. Al, uh, Stafford says. 
my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole. It was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And that's why we share Christ. I trust that there's been a moment in your life when you said, Lord, I believe. I believe in the cross. I believe on the one who gave his life there on the cross, paid the total propitiation for my sin. I believe in him, God's son. I'd like to talk to you if you've not made that decision. If you're listening today, I pray that you've made that commitment in your life. And that as we go from this place today, you'll share, there is a way. There is a hope. His name is Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the hope that Paul gave us through your word. Thank you, Father, that he knew, who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. And in him we rejoice today, and in him we want to share today. For we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.